Hi, grade tens. Welcome to week uh, six of distance learning. Uh, we are starting a new unit um, this week. So we are now done with biology. If you have any questions or concerns, you'll be getting your final um, assessments back from biology this week. Um, and we are going to be moving on to unit four, which is our last unit of study that we'll be finishing off the year with, um, which is light and optics, our physics unit. So I have posted a new link for you where you'll be able to find um, all your worksheets, PowerPoints, everything on Google Drive. And we will also, as always, be posting at the beginning of the week uh, your calendar where everything's hyperlinked for you so you can find it easily uh, during distance learning. Uh, please remember to check that calendar, check my office hours, fill out your ref uh, reflection forms. And uh, any questions you have, you can email me. And if they are specific homework questions, um, or work that we're going through, especially as we enter this unit and there'll be a little bit of calculations, uh, make sure to check your f the frequently asked document sheet. Um, not a ton of an email to me, so so far the document's pretty general, but uh, anything that uh, consistently gets asked or a question with a full solution uh, will be posted there, so keep an eye out for that. Okay, so what we are gonna be starting today is lesson one, which is an introduction to light and color, okay? Um, so we are in chapter 10 of your textbook now uh, because we are entering our new unit. So we're in 10.1, page 380 to 388 today. Okay, so we're going to start off by introducing a little bit about the physics unit, what we're going to be talking about. We're going to talk about light, and we're going to be talking about what a wave is and what the wave model of light states. And then we're going to be talking a little bit about visible light, both the additive color theory and the subtractive color theory. You're going to be ending today doing part, not a full, but uh, only one of the activities from a gizmo to help you practice uh, some of the color theory. So by the end of the class today, what we should be able to do is label the parts of a wave uh, and describe its connection to light and also be able to dis describe subtractive and additive color theory of light. OK, so what is light? We are going to be learning about light and optics in this unit. So if we're looking at a scientific definition, what is light? Well, light really is modeled in more than one way. So the first model that we're going to be looking at in this unit is called the wave model of the light. Um, and the wave model of light pictures light as traveling in a wave. Um, and it explains a lot of things about light very well. Specifically, color is explained very well using this light model, a uh, wave model of light. But um, it doesn't, and it does help us visualize a lot of things about light, but we will see that we do sometimes model it in more than one way. So there are some components of light that aren't well uh, explained using this light mo uh, wave model. So what's a wave? A wave is a disturbance that transfers energy without transferring matter, okay? So if you've ever been to a wave pool before or a beach or a lake or even just a regular pool before, um, we can see waves very easily in water. And you can see this even in your kitchen if you take out a big pot and put some water or fill your sink up with water. Um, water doesn't actually have to move forward or backwards to have a wave happen, okay? So waves move energy forward without moving matter forward. So what that means is, for example, if we were at a lake and we were looking at a wave, okay, and there was something floating on the lake, like a loon, if you're ever up in cottage country, Okay. As the wave goes up and down, you'll see that the animal or the loon moves up and down without actually getting pushed forward or pulled backwards. Okay. The only time it would get pushed forward or backward is if there was a tide also associated with it, which isn't what we're talking about here. We're just talking about a still wave. Okay. So the water here isn't actually moving forward and backward. The only thing that's moving forward and backward is energy. And that's how we can see waves in like wave pools. It moves the water in the pool up and down, so we get these big waves, but the water itself actually isn't moving forward or backward because it's a pool, it's stuck in one spot, okay? So a wave, when we're describing it scientifically, is just a disturbance that transfers energy forward without transferring matter forward, okay? So it says, for example, a water wave allows energy to be transferred in the wave without actually moving the water that makes up the wave. All that's happening is the water's going up and down and up and down and up and down. It's not actually moving forward or backwards, okay? So there's a few key parts of the wave that we should be able to <laughs> identify. The top, the highest point of the wave, just like on a mountain, you may talk about a mountain crest, is the highest point. So this would be a crest of the wave, this would be a crest of the wave, this would be a crest of the wave. 
and the lowest part of the wave is called a trough. You may have heard of a trough before, like often what we feed farm animals out of, those like semicircle things we call troughs. And we can see this kind of looks like a semicircle. So this lowest point here is called a trough. Okay. Um, the rest position is this imaginary line that kind of goes right through the wave. So it's symmetrical on either side. And that's where in this case, because this is modeled as a water wave, where the water would sit if it was at rest, there was no energy moving through it in the form of a wave. So first thing in the morning, if you've ever been to a cottage and you look out on the lake and it's really still and really, really flat, that would be considered the rest position of the wave. Okay, the distance between either the trough and the rest position or the crest and the rest position, okay, is called the amplitude. So that's how tall the wave is. If it was a really, really, really big wave, we would say it has a really big amplitude or if it was just a really small wave like that, it would have a much smaller amplitude. Also, we can measure from crest to crest, so the crest of the first wave to the crest of the second wave, or trough of one wave to trough of the next wave, and that's called the wavelength. It's also represented by this Greek letter right here, okay? So if you ever see this written down, they're talking about how long the wavelength is. So there's two things we can measure about the wave. The amplitude, so how much is it going up and down, and also the wavelength. Is it a really, really quick short wave, or is it a long wave like that, okay? And uh, different amounts of energy will be passed depending on both the amplitude and the wavelength of the wave. Okay, this is a diagram from your textbook as well in those same pages in 10.1 if you want to copy that into your notes. Okay, we also often will measure this in what's called the frequency of the wave. Okay, the frequency is essentially the rate of how fast the uh, uh, waves repeat one another. Okay. So in general, the longer the wavelength, the shorter the uh, the longer the wavelength, the lower the frequency, and the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency. So for example, we can see these are pretty long wavelengths. So we would say it's at very low frequency. It's repeating at a much slower rate. Whereas these waves here, we can see are repeating really, 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 really quickly, and that's because they have a very short wavelength. So they would have a much higher frequency. Okay. Uh, the more, the higher the frequency, the more energy is actually passed along with the wave, because we know waves transfers energy without transferring matter. And the standard symbol is F, and it's measured in something called hertz, which is cycles per second. So how many times does the wave go through a cycle in a second? Uh, next time, if you're ever in a car that has a, a radio, you know when you um, go into the car and you go to 99.9 .9 for your radio station, what you're actually looking at is you're going to 99.9 .9 hertz, okay, which is a specific radio frequency, which is how you hear um, music coming from that specific radio channel. So if you look, a lot of cars, it'll, if you look at the dash where, the, where you're selecting the radio station, it'll actually say, uh, you can see it says HZ in really small printing, usually in the corner, we don't even realize it. The next time you're in your car, you may actually look at it and you can tell mom or dad, parent or guardian, whoever's driving you around, that uh, that's what you're measuring is the frequency of the radio wave, okay? Uh, which helps you uh, distinguish between different channels, which is pretty cool. Okay, so as the frequency increases and the wavelength shortens, uh, it's going to have an impact on uh, the energy that's associated with that wave. Okay, so essentially the higher the frequency and the shorter the wavelength, the more energy is going to be passed through the wave. And the way you can actually model this, you can do this at home. If you can, if you go to your sink and you fill it up with water, or you take a cup or a bowl and you fill it up with water, if you're going to try to make a high frequency water wave, you're going to have to tap the surface of the water a lot quicker to make shorter wavelengths, higher frequency. To do that, you are putting in more energy into the system. So the wavelengths that come out are going to actually pass on more energy as well. If I wanted to make a very low frequency, okay, or uh, long wavelength, I'm going to tap it a lot slower to make sort of bigger, slower waves. And you can see I'm using less energy to create those waves as I tap. So less energy is going to come out of those waves as well. Okay. Uh, you can also measure these. If you want to know the speed of the wave, you can measure the frequency by the wavelength. If you remember this little symbol here, represent wavelengths. It's going to come out in centimeters a second. We're not going to have to do those calculations, but that is um, something that helps us prove energy frequency um, about waves, that relationship with waves. 
The neat thing about light as well is light is a form of energy, okay? And visible light, the light that we can perceive with our eyes is only a very small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's actually surrounded, so if this is the difference between really, really long waves and really, really short waves, the waves that we can actually perceive as visible light or color is just right in here. It's a really small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum and it's surrounded by these other waves that are like light, but we just don't perceive them. So for example, those radio waves that you get in your car are much longer uh, wavelengths. Okay, they have a much lower frequency and a much lower energy associated with them. That's why we don't really worry about being exposed to things like radio waves. Okay, um, but we also can't see radio waves. When you turn the radio on in your car, it's not like all of a sudden you see this magic dust coming to the antenna of your car to, to transmit those radio signals. Okay, um, microwaves, so the same waves that you use in your microwave to heat up your food is a type of electromagnetic radiation. Uh, UV light, so that's the light that comes from the sun. We learned about that back in our space unit. And things like x-rays or gamma rays. Gamma rays are often used in lasers. Those are very short wavelengths, so very high frequency, high energy waves. These are the waves that we worry about um, because they're so high energy getting exposed to. So for example, we know that we don't want to be overexposed to x-rays. If we can avoid that, it's better because that energy can mutate um, in our uh, the, some of the DNA in our cells. Or gamma rays, lasers, we know can, can uh, cause a lot of damage and it's because they're very high frequency, high energy, uh, low wavelength waves. Okay, but the small little bit that we can see that we call the visible light spectrum is right here in between um, infrared and ultraviolet. Okay. okay, so we can see sort of the size here. So things like a radio wave usually is between about the, the wavelength would be between the size of a building and a human. Whereas when we're looking at something like an X-ray or a gamma ray, the wavelength is only about the size of a, an atomic nuclei or an atom. Okay, So these waves are going from very different frequencies and wavelengths and also, again, um, sending different amounts of energy. Okay, So you can take a look there if you're interested. So electromagnetic radiation is a wave pattern made of both electric and magnetic fields that can travel through space. This extends from the most tiny, which are the gamma waves, to the longest, which we saw are radio waves. Uh, how this applies to visible light is the only reason we can perceive different colors. And the different colors that we probably know back from elementary school when we learned the radio, uh, rainbow, sorry, not radio, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Um, if you haven't heard before, an easy way to remember the order would be Roy G Biv. So R O Y, like the first name, middle initial G, B I V is the last name. If you remember Roy G Biv, that'll help you remember the orders red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Okay, the only reason why my eyes can see the difference between colors, so the difference between red or blue, is my eyes can perceive the different wavelengths and it tells me that those different wavelengths are associated with different colors. So for example, of the visible light spectrum, oops, red is the longest wave, okay? So it's got the lowest frequency, the lowest energy, whereas violet is the shortest wave, so it's gonna have the highest frequency, the highest energy. Okay. So again, we can see the difference in the wavelengths between these different colors. And uh, you wouldn't have to memorize these. This is just so you can see that they are different. And again, this is a small little portion of the electromagnetic spectrum going all the way from huge radio waves to tiny, tiny, tiny little gamma rays. So again, saying radio waves about the size of a building or a person down to a gamma rays, which is the wavelengths only about the size of a nuclei. But um, how we mix colors of light is a little bit different than how we learned how we mix colors of things like pigment. So if you remember back in elementary school, you learned things like if I mix red paint with blue paint, I'm going to get purple paint. Okay. Light, different colors of light do mix, but the way they mix and the colors they produce are not the same as those primary colors of pigment. Okay. So there still are three uh, primary colors of light but they are different than the three primary colors that we would think of like pigment, like paint, okay? So the three primary colors of light are green, blue, and red. 
which is different. Blue and red are primary colors of pigment we've learned about before, but you, when you learn back in elementary school, well, you would say, no, green isn't a primary color, it's made of blue and yellow. Well, light acts differently, so green is actually a primary color of light. Okay? These primary colors can mix together to make secondary colors of light, just like pigments can, but the secondary colors are a little bit different. Cyan is one, like a light blue. Magenta, like a purpley pink. And yellow is a secondary color of light. Okay? So here's how additive color theory works. If you mix red light, which is a primary color of light, with blue light, another primary color of light, you're going to get magenta. Okay, so if I had a spotlight on that was red and I mixed it with a spotlight that was blue, the color that's going to be produced by those two colors, those two colors of lights mixing would be magenta. Uh, if I mix green light with blue light, I'm going to get this color right here, which is called cyan. And if I mix red light with green light, you're going to produce yellow light. And again, if you mix all the colors of light together, all the primary colors of light, red, green, and blue, you're going to get white. White is made of all of the colors of light. Okay. So if I mix just red and blue, I'm going to get magenta. If I mix just blue and green, I'm going to get cyan. If I just mix green and red, I'm going to get yellow. If I mix all three of those colors together, I'm going to get white. Okay. So how does that actually work on what I see? Okay. So subtractive color theory of light tells us how that how we perceive different colors in our eye. Okay. So subtractive color theory of light says when a light strikes when light strikes an object, some of that light is going to be reflected and some of that light is going to be absorbed. Okay. The color you see is actually the color that's being reflected, not the color that's being absorbed. So what I like to think of it as is I'm only going to see light the uh, colors as long as that color of light goes into my eye because remember the cells that are perceiving your colors are in your eyes so unless that color goes into your eye you can't perceive it okay so the colors you actually see are the colors being reflected off the object not the colors being absorbed by the object okay a lot of times we think well if it's being reflected it's not getting sucked into that object and we're not seeing that color that's not the case. It's what actually goes into your eye is what you see. So for example, let's look at yellow. Okay, so I have a yellow highlighter right here. What's happening is white light from outside, which we know is made of all the different colors of light, is coming in to this object okay, and hitting the object. Now yellow, if you remember, is a secondary color of light. So it's made of uh, red light and green light. So what's going to happen is the three primary colors of light are coming in, the white light from the window, because white's made of all the colors of light, it's coming in, it's hitting this highlighter. Some of the light is going to bounce off to go into my eye, some of the light is going to be absorbed. Because this is yellow, okay, you can see right here, this blue light is going to get absorbed by my highlighter, and what's going to bounce off into my eye is red light and green light, okay? When that gets into my eye, my eye can perceive, okay, there's red and green. Red and green together make yellow. So my eye can look at this object and say, this is a yellow object, okay? On the other hand, let's say I have an object that is red. So I have a red pen here. Again, white light is coming in from my window right now. It's hitting the object. White's made of all the three primary colors of light, red, green, and blue, okay? What's this gonna absorb? Well, it's gonna absorb green light it's going to absorb blue light, and what's going to reflect into my eye is red light. My eye is going to say red light means red object, so I perceive this object as red. Okay. If I had a cyan object, so this is a little more blue, but let's just pretend this is more cyan. Okay, light comes, oh, here we go, here's something cyan. Okay, so I have a portable charger here that's cyan. What's going to happen? Light's going to come in from my window. Okay, white light, which is made of all three colors of light, red, green, blue. Okay, what's going to absorb? Red is going to absorb, green's going to bounce off and go in my eye, blue's going to bounce off and go into my eye. So my eye perceives green and blue, we know when green and blue mix together we see cyan, so this object is perceived as cyan. Remember, what we're actually seeing is the light that bounces off into our eye, so our eye can perceive a color, not so it's being absorbed by the object, 
Okay, whatever color doesn't make up, whatever colors of light don't make up what color I'm perceiving needs to be what was absorbed. It's not, it takes a little while, so you're going to have some time to practice this on gizmos, so don't get too discouraged yet, okay? Uh, it is just a little bit of practice, but we can see the examples here of the three secondary colors if you do need some help, okay? Uh, again, remember, white, if you perceive something as white, it means all of the colors are being reflected, and if you perceive something as black, it means none of the colors are being reflected, okay? So if I have a white box right here, lights coming in, white lights coming in, made of all red, green, and blue, it's going to come in, hit the object, none of the light's going to be absorbed, it's all going to bounce off the one to my eye, red, green, blue, and my eye is going to say, okay, a mixture of red, green, and blue light makes white. Whereas if something is black, like a little sweater I have here, lights coming in from the window, red, green, blue, all hitting the object, the object's going to absorb all of the colors though, red, green, blue, there's an absence of light going into my eye, so I'm going to perceive this as black. So you should be able to look at this picture. This is really good practice to get ready for your gizmo. You have cyan, you have red, you have yellow, okay? You have a lot of the colors that we discussed. Look at each object and say, okay, this is yellow. What's gonna happen? Well, I know yellow is made of red and green. So blue is gonna be absorbed by this picture of the Skittle. Red's gonna reflect off, um, green's gonna reflect off, I'll perceive it as yellow. You can point to the different primary and secondary colors. Don't worry about things like pink and orange, okay? Uh, just, you should be able to tell me how you perceive all of the primary, so red, green, blue, and secondary, cyan, magenta, and yellow um, colors in your eye. Okay, so what are you going to be doing today? Uh, to finish off, you're not doing the full gizmo, you're only going to do a part of it, okay? So again, remember, you're going to go to Explore Learning. Move my face out of the way here. You're going to log in. Remember, your username should be your GAPS password, your GAPS email, and your password should be your password unless you created it to be something else. If you forget it, you can email me and I can uh, let you know what they are, but we have been doing these quite often, so you should be able to um, see it. Okay, when you go to our classroom, you're going to be able to see we have one called Additive Colors of Light. Okay, you're going to be launching the gizmo, you're, a worksheet has been posted for you that you're going to follow along with just like we have in previous weeks. Uh, but you're only going to be doing one of the three activities, you're just going to be doing activity A, you don't need to do activity B and C. So the other two activities have been deleted from your handout. You're going to be working through additive color theory of light. And remember, some of us are still forgetting, when you are done, please make sure to go through these five multiple choice questions and make sure when you finish you click check your answers okay so I can um, see so you're gonna submit your handout submit these five questions okay um, just to consolidate the additive and subtractive color theory of light from today's lesson okay hope that makes sense hope everyone is staying safe uh, staying healthy and staying at home looking forward to hopefully seeing you guys very soon okay thanks see you in our next lesson